Good evening, friends. Warm welcome to all of you from the Urological Society of India. This is the first webinar after Dr. Sabnis has taken over at Ahmedabad. And today we are dealing with the topic evaluation and management of erectile dysfunction, which is a very commonly encountered by the urologists in their practice. The value of properly assessing and managing erectile dysfunction relates not only to the affected individuals and their partners, but also to their family and society, and its scope encompasses physical and mental wellness aspects related to addressing the sexual dysfunction, concurrent disease management, as well as its socioeconomic burden. To address these issues, we have none other than Dr. Rupin Shah, who would be convening this session, along with eminent faculty, Dr. Raman Tanwar, Dr. Vineet, and Dr. Priyank Kothari. And with this few introductory remarks, I would now, now invite Dr. Ravindra Sabnis, President of the Urological Society of India, to give his remarks. Over to you, Dr. Sabnis. Thank you. Thank you, Kesha. <clears throat> I have great pleasure in uh, presiding over this uh, webinar. First webinar, as you said, uh, of, of my tenure. I remember when the COVID uh, time started uh, in uh, 20, March 20, we had actually planned the andrology workshop in MPOH, Nadia, with Rupin Shai, which was a routine yearly workshop which we had planned. And then suddenly we had to change to um, the Zoom. That time Zoom was a little bit new. And a lot of enthusiasm for members to participate in the Zoom meetings. And I remember that was our first uh, webinar which we organized on andrology. And it was um, so overwhelmingly uh, successful that within uh, no time, 500 uh, members, uh, delegates logged in. And then in the second session, we had to actually take the higher plan to accommodate more uh, number of uh, uh, members for logging in. So that was the kind of response which we had on the subject of andrology. Ironically, uh, that was my first webinar uh, uh, in the, which we organized on MPOH on andrology. And today, as a president, I'm uh, organizing first webinar on andrology, Rubin as a main speaker. So I have a great pleasure in um, having this webinar as a first webinar. And andrology, actually speaking, as Rupin keeps on pointing out to everyone, that it does not require any hi-fi instrument, hi-fi equipments. It requires only your understanding and concepts should be clear. And then any urologist can actually practice andrology. So andrology uh, as a subspecialty has traditionally got very poor exposure for various reasons. But as we are forming now subspecialities, I'm sure andrology will get its due uh, respect and due exposure. And I'm sure all the people who are uh, on the faculty will also promote and will take uh, that speciality much higher. So with this uh, introduction, I, uh, I must thank Dr. Rupin Shah for uh, taking this uh, sparing time. He is very busy. He has no time, but he has managed to find time along with uh, Raman Tanwar, Vinit Malhotra and Priyank. So I wish a great success for this uh, webinar. Incidentally, this is the first webinar under the chairmanship of Dr. Arun Chawla also, who has taken over in Ahmedabad as uh, ISU chairman. And he also has uh, logged in. So I have a great pleasure in um, starting this webinar. With these few words, I hand over to Dr. Keshav Murthy again. Thank you, sir. Now I would invite Dr. Arun Chavla, Chair of the Indian School of Urology, to give his remarks and then introduce the speakers. Over to you, Arun. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, as you are all aware that today's webinar is on the evaluation of uh, and management of uh, erectile dysfunction. And the convener of uh, this webinar is none other than Dr. Rupin Shah. Uh, Dr. Rupin Shah is, uh, uh, doesn't need a formal introduction. A dawn in the field of uh, uh, andrology, or we can say a father of andrology in India. Uh, he is a consultant andrologist and a, a, a microsurgeon, specialized in microsurgical procedures for availability and uh, penile process. He has been uh, founder president of uh, uh, South Asian uh, Sexual Medicine Society, more than 100 papers and chapter to his credit. He is associate editor. Uh, uh, two of, uh, uh, of fertility and uh, uh, research. He has been a recipient of prestigious uh, BCRI award and a urology president gold medal. Uh, 
uh, and has many other national and international honor to his credit. So with this, uh, he is joined by our young, experienced uh, faculty, Dr. Raman Tanwar, Dr. Vineet Malhotra, and Dr. Parin Kadari, uh, though young, but have distinguished themselves in the field of andrology um, in India. Uh, with this, I hand over to Dr. Rupicha for um, you know, taking over uh, this webinar and start the proceedings. Uh, to all the delegates, uh, if you have any question, please put in the chat box. Will this question will be taken together at the end of uh, all the uh, talk series? Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chavla. It's a great pleasure. I would even say an honor to be the opening batsman in Submiss's team, both when he started. <laughs> Zoom meetings in Nadia, then I remember there was so much excitement, pages of instructions on how to access Zoom. And now most of that could do it in our sleep because we've been Zooming around like witches on a broomstick for so many months and months. So it's wonderful to be part of something that Sabnis organizes and Dr. Arun Chawla has been a very close friend. I don't like to travel, but whenever he invites me to Manipal, there's no way in which I can say no to him. So to have both of them organize this is a great pleasure. I'm also very happy to have, I like seeing young andrologists with me. It makes me feel old and grandfatherly. But yes, we have a wonderful team of people who have been really taking andrology forward. For many years, I felt that maybe andrology might just die a natural death or an unnatural death. But now I see a lot of young urologists taking a great deal of interest in the subject and some of the Young pioneers are here with us today, and we will have the pleasure of hearing them. So, as, Sub, as Subnis said, the, uh, the management, one moment, phone bandra hope. Sorry, the painters in the vicinity and their phones have more voice than mine. Um, so, as Subnis said very correctly, Andrology doesn't need special equipment. And every week somebody writes to me, we want to start an andrology department. What equipment should we get? So the first talk today is in fact on how to evaluate a male. And as you will see, we need no equipment at all for the purpose of examining. Oops, sorry, I've opened the wrong talk. Uh, we need no equipment at all for the purpose of examining and evaluating a male. So that is going to be an opening only. Okay, is my full screen seen now? Yes, very well. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I just spoke about how we can do Zoom in our sleep and then of course there has to be a malfunction. So the first part of the talk is going to be on a practical therapy guided approach. And I'm emphasizing practical because I'm going to start with a rather shocking slide, which will state what are the two most commonly abused tests in the management of sexual dysfunction. And given the fact that these feature in most algorithms, when I say that these two are the most misleading tests, I need to explain myself. And then I will tell you which are the most useful tests, which need no equipment, which are hardly performed, which are not mentioned in the textbook, but which really give you a diagnosis in the vast majority of cases. So first, why are these two tests not useful? Testosterone, widely done by everybody, widely misunderstood, misinterpreted, and a huge number of men get treated with testosterone who don't need it. So bear in mind that the main impact of testosterone is on libido. As testosterone drops, the first thing that goes is libido. The last thing that goes is erectile function. So if I have a diabetic, 60-year-old candidate for hypogonadism, he says, Doc, I really feel the urge, but I don't get the erection. His problem would be vasculogenic and not due to hypogonadism, even if his testosterone levels are borderline. In young men especially, Erection is hardly dependent on testosterone. And you can see this in your infertility clinics where you'll get men with Kleinfelters, tiny testes, testosterone of 180, 200, who are still having sex twice a week. When you give them testosterone, the frequency may go up. They may say the erections are better. But 
even with 180 milligrams, they're quite functional with good erections and normal sex. And therefore, a common error, young couple comes with unconsummated marriage. The first thing you do is a testosterone. Testosterone is 300, and usually that's due to a lab error or natural variation. And the poor couple spends the next two months with the man being given testosterone, which is of no value at all. So be very cautious when you ask for testosterone for ED and how you interpret it. Use it with common sense. Bear in mind that libido is more critical. Perhaps in older men, 60 plus, who have long-standing hypogonadism, correcting testosterone may help. But for the majority, this is a misabused uh, investigation and a misused form of therapy. Now, penile color Doppler, a very sophisticated, beautiful looking test and by and large useless and very misleading. Why do I say that? So I need to explain this. For an erection to happen, we need to understand what changes are taking place in the cavernosal smooth muscle. So to the left at the bottom diagram is a penis which is flaccid and you can see the cavernosal smooth muscle is contracted and the spaces are collapsed. In this scenario, the patient doesn't have an erection, he's in a natural state of venous leak. If you were to do a penile color Doppler on this man, you will find physiological venous leakage. So all 80 of you are listening to this symposium just now. If somebody were to bring a penile color Doppler and study you, all of you would show venous leakage. As an erection evolves, you move to the right of the picture where the smooth muscle relaxes, the cavernosal spaces start filling up and the venules get compressed. So if at this moment you stopped listening to me and started flipping through a Playboy magazine, you will get a partial erection only because Playboy is tame. With that partial erection, the cavernosal spaces will open, but they will not be open enough to compress the venous outflow. The arterial inflow would increase to some degree and a penile color Doppler done at this stage will still reveal arterial insufficiency and venous leakage. It's only if you were to this log from this meeting and start doing something else and got a really hard erection that you would be in your true physiological state. And then the penile color Doppler would show absence of uh, any leakage. And just a moment, please. Daddy. Hello, sorry, I've got people around who keep on talking. So what happens in most studies when a penile color Doppler is done, the patient is injected with pepaverin alone, which is not sufficient to overcome the level of anxiety that he has. It is done in a setup where many people are peeping in, so the level of anxiety is further exacerbated. And if you were to ask a patient who's had a penile color Doppler that when you were injected, did you get a full erection? Most of the time they will say, no, they'll say, doc, I get a much better erection at home. In other words, most penile color Dopplers are done in a state of physiological venous leakage, and that is why they are highly misleading. It's my experience day in, day out, and it has been published in studies. Here is a study from urology, which was titled Unreliability of a Duplex Scan in Diagnosing Veno-Occlusive Disease. And what the authors found, you can read in the conclusion at the bottom, that when they repeated the color Doppler after counseling, to reduce anxiety, most of these patients did not show venous leakage. So all too often, unfortunately, we do a penile color Doppler, which is not needed, land up with a wrong diagnosis. And most of the patients who come to me have been told, you have venous leakage, you need surgery. And when they come to us, instead, we do one of these two tests and actually discover that they are normal. So very quickly, because the time is limited, how are these two tests done? The office sildenafil test, patient comes to the clinic, take the history, we give him 100 milligrams of sildenafil, call him back one hour later in a private room, ask him to stimulate the penis, fantasize, and every 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes, you assess the erection. If he has a good full erection, right away it tells us that he's functionally normal. If he fails to get a response that does not have significance, because many men due to anxiety, may not respond in the clinic. We will then ask him to try the tablet at home and come back and report the next time. And we may repeat the test using an anxiolytic. If he has a normal response, this is very reassuring. 
It allows us to assess size, curvature, and quality of erection, and particularly in single males or unconsummated marriage, where the self-reported history may not be accurate, it's a very useful test. If they fail to get a good erection, then we would do the intracavernosal injection test. Now, it is very important not to do it with pepaverine alone. Pepaverine doesn't give enough stimulation, does not overcome anxiety, is painful, and is more likely to cause fibrosis. So the drug that has to be used is either bimix or trimix. Phentolamine is no longer available in India. Chlorpromazine is available, but you need to look for it. And therefore, all intracavernosal injection testing should be done with a bimix, with pepaverine chlorpromazine, or prostaglandin. This is how you prepare the bimix. 4 ml of pepaverine, 0.15 ml of chlorpromazine will produce a stock solution in which 4 ml will have 120 milligrams of pepaverine and 4 milligrams of chlorpromazine, which means per ml it's 30 milligram pepaverine, 1 milligram chlorpromazine. And the starting dose of this is just 0.1 ml because this is much, much more potent than pepaverine. If you add PG1 to it, it becomes a trimix. So to do the office CVAD, we will start with just 0.1 to 0.2 ml of the injection. Again, the patient fantasizes and stimulates the penis, and you assess the erection at 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes, and compare it with the erection that he gets at home. If they get a full erection with a low dose, right away it tells you that this is either psychogenic or sometimes neurogenic. If he requires higher doses, it may be anxiety or moderate vasculogenic. So just by comparing the response in the clinic to sildenafil or the intracavernosal injection and comparing that with the morning erection, the sexual erection, you can reach a working diagnosis of it is psychogenic, neurogenic, moderate vasculogenic or severe vasculogenic. Neurogenic and psychogenic may respond to very low doses. Sometimes psychogenic may need a higher dose or an anxiolytic. Moderate vasculogenic will respond to high doses with a near full erection. Severe vasculogenic will not respond to any dose. So much more than any other test, these two tests done correctly will tell us exactly what the problem is. So very quickly now, two cases to illustrate what I've tried to convey. So here is a couple, and these are real cases. Young couple, unconsummated marriage, they come and say, doc, he's not getting an erection. We've consulted two doctors, we've been advised an implant, so we've come to you. This is our past prescription, and you can see he's been given anxiolytics, two or three kinds, prelox, which is a general sexogenic, erectogenic, and plus he's been given Viagra. Luckily, he wasn't given testosterone. Most of them would have been. It did not work. Then he had a penile color Doppler. And if you read the bottom, it says, findings are suggestive of arterial insufficiency with a non satisfactory response to pepaverine. Comes to us and all we did was the office sildenafil test. And this is what he had a full erection sustained for 20 minutes. Obviously there was no vasculogenic problem. He did not need an implant. All they needed was counseling. And with that, the problem was solved. Counseling plus intercourse using sildenafil at home. Second case, again, unmarried male had tried intercourse with a partner, not successful, had pain in the foreskin and also says that I can't ejaculate during masturbation. So he's a wreck. He's convinced that he's an ejaculation. He has erectile dysfunction, obviously had a penile color Doppler. And again, at the bottom, you can see he was told he has arterial insufficiency. Now, in this case, his anxiety levels were high. When we did the office sildenafil test, he did not get a full erection, but with just 0.15 ml, that's five milligrams of pepaverine and chlorpromazine, he had a full erection, lasted two hours, we had to inject adrenaline to detumesce him. We put him on the vibrator in three minutes he ejaculated. So in summary, most patients can be evaluated and treated by just two simple tests, the office sildenafil test, and if that fails, the intracavernosal injection test, you do not need penile color Doppler, testosterone, or any sophisticated testing. So we'll stop here and move on to two very excellent talks, which is how to manage these patients. Once you've reached a working diagnosis, Raman is going to tell us about the use of PD-5 inhibitors, and then Vinit will continue with intracavernosal injection. 
So Raman, it's over to you. All question answers will be taken at the end. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for the opportunity, uh, Rupin sir, and thank you to ISU, the uh, Indian School of Theology and the USI for the opportunity. I'm just going to share my screen. I hope it's it's visible to all. So as per instructions of Dr. Rupin sir, I have been asked to talk about the medical management of ED. And as you can see in the flyer, it's written in brackets, phosphodiesterase inhibitors also. Now, basically this means that uh, we'll be focusing more on the phosphodiesterase inhibitors, but let me start from where we are coming. So whenever we have a patient with erectile dysfunction, we typically have some counseling to do. And then if counseling and lifestyle changes don't work, then we switch over to medications. And then if they don't work, then something like ICI VAD or vacuum reduction devices, and then henceforth move to maybe experimental therapy. And if that also doesn't work, then surgical management. And then something in the future, which I have left as an arrow in the, uh, in the future. So basically the man medical management of erectile dysfunction includes first finding out what are the indications of really treating this patient? What is the possible cause and looking at the right, right medicine for the patient? We have to look at the available medication. We should have the knowledge of all the possible medication that we have in our armamentarium. We have to make the right selection for these patients as to which drug to choose. We have to counsel the patient around the expectation from the management and troubleshoot often and then, you know, talk about duration and everything. So let me start first by, you know, talking about the first consultation, which is a crucial consultation because me being from the background of men's health, I understand that men do not come to the hospital. Men coming to the hospital is a rare event. So it takes a lot of courage for a man to come for a consult for erectile dysfunction or for sexual dysfunction. So when he comes to you and he feels that you are capable to really take care of his problem, then you have to over prepare for it and you have to over deliver to that man because a repeat consult may never happen. And for a repeat consult to happen, you need to have a good initial consult. You have so the most important thing that we need and Rupin sir will agree to it is time. Uh, we don't need equipment, we need time. We have to counsel the patient with AIDS. He should, uh, he should feel that he's in a professional environment where there are AIDS available for him to be able to describe the problem. Uh, we should be probing into the pathophysiology, explaining the uh, treatment blueprint to the patient so that he understands what's going to happen in case things don't happen the way they are supposed to happen with medicines. And uh, we have to give an effective therapy to the patient uh, because it is the first that you take care of this patient. Next time when the patient comes, you don't need to give so much time to this patient. If you need less time, it will uh, be a recurring concern once the faith is established. So don't worry about it because you know the, the cycle that this patient is coming from is basically that probably from a quack who has more time to give to this patient. He has a gift of gap to give to this patient. He has false reassurances to give to this patient. And because of the poor outcome or the poor experience, he has come to an andrologist probably. And if you're giving less time, uh, if you're if you're not able to convince the patient and if you're not able to give him an effective therapy and relief, then again he's going to fall back to the quack. So it's going to be a cycle that is going to go on, and we have to break the cycle to, uh, of course, again establish andrology with firmer grounds in the country. So let us look at some available medicines which are available. So phosphodiesterase five inhibitors is what our main talk is. So what we have available is sildenafil, tadalafil, avanafil. Certain places we have Vardenafil available, and then we have Udenafil available in India. So these are only the ones which are available. Apart from that, there are all many other phosphodiesterase inhibitors like Modernafil and others which are not currently available in India. But we also have other medications available like nutraceuticals are available. We have tricyclic anxiolytics which are available, which Rupin sir all said have are sometimes given by andrologists. Then we have uh, testosterone replacement therapies and serums available for selected indications, as Dr. Rubin said, it shouldn't be overexploited. And we have phos based therapy also. So let's talk about the phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors. So I've tried to make this very, very small table where we'll be doing mainly the talking. So sildenafil, we know it's, it's the wonder drug. It revolutionized the whole world when it came to phosphodiesterase 5, uh, the management of erectile dysfunction. In 1996 onwards, so the dose available are 25 mg, 50 mg, 100 mg. Typically, we start with 50 mg. So the pros of this drug are that it's a very effective drug. 
most of will agree on the most potent drug. If nothing else is working for the patient, would still be sildenafil. We'll always ask the patient to try this first and get back to us. It's a trusted drug. And when the, the formulation is right, when the compression of the tablet is right, when it comes from a good company, it's a wonderful drug to treat the patient and establish his faith in allopathic system of medicine for treatment of erectile dysfunction. It has a fast onset of action. So typically, you just need to take it an hour or uh, half an hour prior. Uh, it has early clearance, so that's a prong. So I want to tell you about early clearance that, uh, you know, sometimes you want the drug to really get away from the body fast, specifically when probably the patient has to resume his nitrates. For example, if he's a cardiac patient on nitrates, we want him to be able to restart fast be a good drug of choice because it will go away fast. Similarly, a patient with migraine, you know, because migraine can sometimes be precipitated when we take phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors. And in those cases, we want the, the pain to go fast. So we want to tr try something which gets washed away from the body fast. So sildenafil has those kind of pros. It's trusted, effective, and it has faster onset of action and early clearance also. Now, the early clearance can also be a con. So it goes on both the sides. So the, the selection is important and we're going to go there next. But what are the cons of sildenafil? Blue vision is a con because it uh, cross reacts with phosphodiesterase 6, which is in the retina. And you have to take it empty stomach. If you don't take it empty stomach, it's not going to be as effective. And you need to have a good cardiac evaluation. You cannot give it with many other comorbidities. For example, if the patient has been on prostate medicines, it can cause more hypotension than probably tadalafil. So moving on to the next drug, which I may select, which is Tadalafil, which comes in the dose of 5 mg, 10 mg, 20 mg, where 5 mg is actually, as per science, only recognized for improving the flow in patients with, with bladder outlet obstruction, not typically for uh, erectile dysfunction. The doses for erectile dysfunction are 10 and 20, but we do very commonly give 5 mg, especially in patients where we are suspecting the psychogenic erectile dysfunction. Now, the pros of Tadalafil is that it's a long-lasting drug. So you just, it's sometimes also called the weekend pill. So people would just take it on Friday and they would have a good Saturday and Sunday and that will be all they will ever need in the entire week. Then uh, Tadalafil is good if you are looking at a regular use for the patient and also something which is upcoming now, which is called the rehabilitative therapy of the penis. It's a very safe drug. You can give it. There are very little interactions that there are with Tadalafil, specifically with regards to conduction defects and with regards to other medications. It doesn't require many any significant dose adjustment for the elderly population, which are a significant portion of population coming to us for management of erectile dysfunction. But a con would be that it has a late onset of action, and maybe it is not as effective as sildenafil. Uh, this is something that is and Panafil, which has been recently uh, on India last year, and I think we were almost the same thing when the first launch was done. And uh, its doses are again 100 mg and 200 mg. The advantage of Panafil, a uh, source said advantage, I would say, it, it didn't really translate into the practical scenario. It's got a fast act onset of action. They typically say that it acts within 15 minutes, but in practicality, sometimes patients take uh, a couple of hours for the effect to come. But they say that it has less side effects, and that's something that I can vouch for, that there are side effects of Avanafil are really less. It, again, has early clearance, so you can give it to patients who want to restart their nitrates or who have had migraine, and you want the system to clear off the drug as soon as possible so that the headache goes away once it starts with taking off phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors. Cons are that you know it, you cannot rely on it as much as sildenafil, and it probably is less effective than sildenafil, again, just like Tadalafil. And again, just for novelty sake, let's also talk about Denafil, which is in a dose of 100 mg and 200 mg. It is a very good drug. Again, it has a good efficacy. I would say nearly as good as Sildenafil, but the con that the cost and the availability is not as widely available as probably Sildenafil or Tadalafil are. Now the question arises on selection. So we've already seen the phosphodiesterase inhibitors in a nutshell, which were available. Now, basically, how do I select the right drug? So I look at the age of the patient. I have to see if it correlates with the need, with the comorbidities. The requirement, if it's an SOS requirement, then I would prefer something like sildenafil or low-dose tadalafil. If it's a regular requirement, I like to prefer uh, tadalafil. For past usage, I always ask the patient how has been their experience earlier with the earlier medications, what was the acceptance, what were the side effects that helped me guide to select the right medicine. I look at comorbidities. If there are heart problems, then I choose 
probably uh, tadalafil or if i want early resumption of nitrates i choose sildenafil if there is hypertension lutz again tadalafil becomes my drug of choice if migraine sildenafil becomes my drug of choice if it's renal or hepatic problems then tadalafil becomes my drug of choice depending on the degree of ed also i try and make the selection of which drug i would like to give which medical that i should be giving so basically my is quite easy to solve moderate typically we will have to give more potent medicines and if it's severe we may have to go for combination therapy or move beyond medications similarly for associated sexual dysfunction for example if there's a patient with premature ejaculation i want to give that patient depositing as well so then because of similar pharmacokinetics i might like to prefer giving sildenafil to this patient so younger patients typically with sos thing would require maybe a sildenafil also i have to look at economics availability because everything is not available everywhere also when choosing the dose you have to look at certain contraindications that nitrates and alpha blockers you have to daily take the history of the patient has been on any of these you have to look at any medicines that may be uh, going to require a lower dose of phosphodiesterases because they are going to reduce the interactions for example the antifungals and uh, to name a few and then there are certain which require more dosage for example the rifampicin phenobarbital phenytoin carbamazepine and then you have to look at renal hepatic insufficiency and in elderly you have to reduce the dose tadalafil you may not need to reduce the dose so some salient points around how i select my drug is if i choose sildenafil typically for younger patients where one night at a time situation is there whenever there is an occasional need of sexual appetite or opportunity or as a add on to tadalafil if it's not working well or when other medicines are not working or when the patient has associated pulmonary hypotension migraine or when there is depositing being given or when the patient is of a low social economic status i typically choose tadalafil as a workhorse where i am looking at penile rehabilitation where i am looking at weekly demands weekend demands where i am looking at chronic therapy on patients with renal insufficiency or dialysis avanafil typically promised as a very good drug but on patients with who are having severe side effects i may probably want to prefer avanafil udenafil is just a novel sick whenever anything else faces pays i may want to give this as something that might work so uh, we know that uh, there is a cross reaction with a lot of phosphodiesterase inhibitors so typically tadalafil would have caused phosphodiesterase 11 interaction so that can cause severe myalgia typically we stop the drug for a few days and restart if it still happens we shift to anything else typically we started low dose for elderly patients for those with lower urine tract symptoms on alpha blockers and those requiring daily dosage and those with psychogenic ed or where there are hepatic or renal impairments higher doses are needed typically on those patients who have poor relief or high distress or, or on drugs which are increasing the metabolism counseling is again very important uh, you have to try and you know have the couple coming together give the choice to the patient that has also been seen to really work better in terms of medical therapy and you have to tell the patient that organic ed would be typically like a lifestyle disease it can recur it needs chronic therapy because ed here is endothelial dysfunction not just uh, you know it's not just an infection that will go away there are few trouble shooting trips if the drugs are not effective make sure that the patient has been on empty stomach he's been compliant he's not taking any other medicines keep his expectations to the right level and if required we get a testosterone level done because sometimes low testosterone may not make the drug uh, may make the drug less effective if there are serious side effects stop and restart switch to another if there is hypotension choose tadalafil uh, you know choose choose tamsulosin over alfuzosin and do a cardiac evaluation when required and if you find that the effect is reducing you can change the drug go to go to a combination step up the therapy as discussed and you have to ba basically also emphasize lifestyle diseases or changes whenever you are giving a medical therapy i think since time is short i have to stop here uh, the take home messages are apparently very very clear we'll keep in touch and if there are any more queries we are happy to solve them on the chat thank you sir thank you raman for a very lucid and clear talk in what was actually a very short period of time so very nice very useful talk and uh, we'll move on to vinny who will be talking about intrapenile injections thank you sir thank you sir uh, following that excellent presentation uh, excellent presentations i'll start with uh, what if the pill fails i see vad and uh, yeah so we always begin i see vad with the description of giles brindley who dropped his trousers uh to a shocked audience uh, for the AUA meet uh, where he actually demonstrated an erection stimulated by the use of phenoxybenzamine and uh, 
that really set the ball rolling for uh, intrapenile injection therapy. And, uh, and we know it falls into the group of second line therapy where lifestyle changes, uh, psychosexual counseling and drugs have failed. And, and you're looking at what next. It's actually the point uh, in a lot of cases where the urologist actually comes into the picture because you have uh, treatment which has been give, taken either over the counter or uh, has been prescribed by physicians and, and they would uh, not venture into giving intrapenile injections. So these are actually, uh, uh, I, I believe every urologist, every uroandrologist must have this tool in his armamentarium. This is, this is something that will separate him from those that are using PD-5 inhibitors regularly. Uh, so uh, intracavernosal injections of vasoactive drugs, the ones that are used commonly are, uh, alprostadil used to be very common, but it became very expensive and unavailable for use. Caverject was something that we used uh, previously. Bimix is the more, I won't say readily available, but uh, far less expensive alternative. Chlorpromazine sometimes can get a little difficult to procure, but that's the agent of choice that we'll use. And uh, if you wish to add prostaglandin, um, that becomes trimix. And uh, for quad mix, uh, you can add atropine sulfate, though the use of quad mix is practically extremely uncommon. Now, PG1 acts on the penile smooth muscle to stimulate cyclic AMP production, leading to calcium sequestration and subsequent smooth muscle relaxation. Papaverine is a non-specific PD5 inhibitor, increases both cyclic AMP and GMP levels in penile smooth muscles, uh, whereas phentolamine or chlorpromazine will have non-selective alpha adrenergic uh, antagonistic action, uh, sim supplementing and complementing the erectile process. When you are doing the ICVAD process, actually the test and the training for home self-injections actually forms a very, very important part of teaching the patient how this is done. Uh, we can use a graphical representation for them to understand where this injection is actually leading to. The fact that the needle has to go all the way up to the hub, the injection sites where the injection can be given on the sides of the penis, the fact that you don't inject onto the glands because you may miss the cavernosa. So, all of this can be depicted by a graphical uh, a pictorial, which can easily explain to the patient how he's supposed to hold his penis, how he's supposed to inject, and the areas where he can inject. Most agents have very good response rates. Uh, if, you're, uh, if you're not using papaverine alone, which has a low response rate of only about 30%, but if you're using the recommended uh, uh, agents, then Bimix, and trimix both will have very good uh, response rates actually in the range of almost 80 to 90%. Alprostadil will have a higher incidence of penile pain and uh, trimix will have a lower incidence of priapism. Priapism is found in about 05 to 4% in use of all agents. And, and this is important because persistent erection is something which uh, makes the clinician and the patient wary to use this drug. Apart from the fear of injecting oneself, it's the fear of causing a priapismic episode which actually keeps them away from using an injection. So uh, the clinic test, which is the office element, if that's failed, then Bimix, the preparation has already been discussed by Dr. Rupin, but we use 0.1 to 0.3 ml of the stock solution that has been prepared. I'll just explain it again because this is important. You're going to use it in your clinic. So take two ampules of papaverine, take 0.1 ml of chlorpromazine, make this 4.1 ml stock solution. And from this, then use 0.1 to 0.3 ml. This can be kept at room temperature for up to three months. It remains stable. And if you are to add prostaglandin to it, this would be with 2.5 or 5 or 10 micrograms of prostaglandin even. And, and that makes it trimix. Now that requires refrigeration as does alprostadil alone. And then that changes the dynamics of how they're going to store the injections. So in the office test, uh, there's an intracavernosal injection by the clinician, dose determination and training. You will repeat this at another session with patient self-administration under observation where the predetermined dose is, is then confirmed and the technique also confirmed for patient self-injection. We know this test basically bypasses all hormonal and neurological influ influences, and therefore you're able to, in most cases, assess the vascular response far more objectively. 
Another important thing is that you're going to hand a priapism letter to these patients. You don't allow these patients to leave the clinic before they've detumesced. If they've not, so in, in practice, what I will do is that if they've not detumesced for an hour or uh, a little bit more than an hour, then I'm going to inject them because that's the early window where even the first dose of 50 mics of phenylephrine or adrenaline, which has been diluted, will allow detumescence to occur. If it doesn't, you can repeat the dose at five to 10 minute intervals and wait for detumescence to happen. And it mostly happens uh, by the second dose if it's not happened in the first dose, if you've given it early enough. You also give this information letter to the patient to report to the emergency. You have staff in the emergency that's trained to treat these patients that have had persistent erection or an erection that's lasting more than four hours. So the assessment of response is by duration and rigidity of erection. Essentially, a penis that is unable to bend EHS4 would be a good satisfactory response. That which occurs within 10 minutes and lasts for 30 minutes is an ideal response. A normal response will indicate normal erectile hemodynamics. This is also possible with psychogenic erectile dysfunction. Uh, neurologic, because if you've got severe psychogenic, you may not have responded to the office sildenafil test. Neurologic, you'll find very, very low doses giving persistent erection. In fact, there you've got to be wary and you've got to be particularly careful that you'll keep your downer or your phenylephrine or adrenaline ready there. 20% uh, of men with mild vasculogenic disease will also show a positive response even with the, this dose, but the other men with more moderate and severe disease will require higher doses. And a false negative response is seen in men with severe psychogenic ED. Sometimes we've had men who've not responded to even a full dose of bimix. And that could be because they are extremely stressed about the injection that they're receiving, or there's been inadequate dosaging, or there's been incorrect injection method or dosage that's been used. For the home self-injection, you've already determined the test dose. Once that's done, we give pre-filled syringes with the predetermined dose to the patient, tell him that he can store it at room temperature, which means he can just put it in his drawer and save it for about three months of use. Uh, with men that have neurologic uh, erectile dysfunction, we tend to give them pre-filled syringes of uh, downers, as we call them, or uh, phenylephrine or adrenaline also, and train them how to use them if they fail to lose the erection within appropriate time, because they have a very labile erectile response. So it's a very short window or a very small window between which they either have no erection or have a full persistent erection, and which is why it's important for them to carry this. Again, very quickly, I'll explain what the intracavernosal program information to the patients is. Retract the pupus prepuce, stretch the penis from the glance, place the needle on the side shaft, keep a 45 degree angle, push the whole needle into the penis and inject, take out needle, push the site of injection with swab and keep it pressed for about a minute. Erection will occur with stimulation within 5 to 15 minutes. And uh, if you are using PGE1 or alprostadil, keep them refrigerated. If you're not, you can keep them at room temperature. Definitely not more than one injection in a day. And that's a very, very important instruction. A lot of men will call up and say, I tried the first injection. I think it's not been given properly. I think I gave it in the subcutaneous tissue. Can I inject again? And that's an important point to remember that you have to tell them that you cannot inject again because you don't know how much of the drug has actually passed and how much is not. And they may have had or they may get a delayed response. So it's very important instruction to tell them not to use more than one injection in a day. Alternate between the two shafts of the penis so that you can avoid fibrosis, you can avoid hematoma bruising. Avoid the upper middle shaft of the penis. If injected on the urethra, obviously it will cause pain and that's something that's to be avoided. Uh, some men get very worried when they inject into a superficial vein. You can just counsel them that it will cause a little bleeding, but nothing else. Just give pressure and that goes away. And uh, most common cause of failure is an incorrect technique to inject. And that's something important to be mentioned to the patient. If the erection has persisted for more than six, 60 minutes, even with a predetermined dose, the instruction is to lower the dose for the next injection. And if an erection lasts for more than four hours, then definitely need to visit the emergency, call your doctor immediately.
Some of the side effects that patients will report are, we know persistent uh, uh, erection we've spoken about, bruising again, that's something which is temporary and will go away. Fibrosis is something that patients tend to get a lot worried about because somewhere in their mind, it's always there that they are candidates for penile prosthesis therapy and uh, for surgery. And if they end up with a lot of fibrosis that could result in more loss of length or it could make it more difficult for them in to get, undergo surgery, uh, it's a difficult thing. You, you can alternate shafts. I tend to use colchicine for prevention of fibrosis in these men with uh, in uh, that are having home, home self-injection protocols for long durations. And I found it to be of some use. That's something that you can use to reduce the fibrosis that develops following long-term home self-injection. All for today. If you have questions regarding this, you can reach out to me and we can answer them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vinit, for another excellent talk. Uh, intrapenile injections are a very important aspect of management of ED, which unfortunately have kind of fallen into disuse because urologists are not comfortable with it. So I think this was very important in sensitizing people to this usage because otherwise there's nothing to distinguish you from the sexologist or the physician who decides to give sildenafil. In fact, a lot of the patients who you will treat will be the PD-5 failures and therefore you need to be very familiar and comfortable with intrapenile injections. Now the third line of therapy, if the tablet and the injections fail, is the penile prosthesis. We have many kinds of implants. Today, we're going to show the Shah implant because that is by far the cheapest and most widely used implant in India. So for beginners, it's a very good implant, but you need to understand many aspects of it. So in this talk, Priyank is going to show an edited version from a teaching uh, session. So little technical points which are skipped in uh, demonstrations by experts will be highlighted in this uh, video by him. So Priyank, it's over to you. Thank you uh, very much, sir. After some uh, really good talks by uh, the faculty, um, uh, I'd like to present this video. Hopefully, I do justice to the platform and uh, I'll be sharing my screen now. If my voice is unclear, do let me know. Yeah, so I'll be starting. Good evening, respected senior faculty, colleagues, and residents who are attending this USI webinar. I would like to thank the USI, Dr. Arun Chawla sir and Dr. Rupin Shah sir for this opportunity. I'll be presenting an operative video of the sharp penile processes, wherein I will try to highlight each step and suggest tips and nuances required to perform the surgery to achieve desired results. This case was updated at the penile processes workshop at BYL Nair Charitable Hospital under supervision and expert guidance of Dr. Rupin Shah sir. So our case is a 47-year-old male with gradual onset ED who had inadequate response with oral medications and ICI-VAD. He had no known comorbidities and his penile examination was normal with a stretched penile length of 9.5 centimeters. To make it easy, we are going to divide the procedure into simple steps, starting with inner solid incision, proceeding to dissection in the corpora, corporotomy, dilatation, for the provisional measurements, antibiotic wash, then critical measurements, sizing of the implant, removal of the sleeves, insertion of the implant, assessment of adequacy as well as revision, and then closure of the corpora. So now I'll start. Uh, we can either take a vertical penoscotal incision or a transverse penoscotal incision. The reason we prefer a vertical penoscotal incision is because sometimes the vertical incision tears into the penile skin which may not heal so well. The assistant will hold the penis and stretch the scotal skin so that the incision will be one centimeter below the penis scotal junction. And the width of the incision should be such that one is able to grasp the corpora from within the incision. So the incision will go from here to here, as, as you're pointing out. So then we'll start taking the incision as is being described. If we have a ring retractor, we can get away with a smaller incision. Uh, here we take a, we cut the skin and subcutaneous tissue along the line of the incision. Since uh, we are stretching the penis, it appears as if the incision is penile. But as we cut, 
and now when we'll relax the grip on the on the penis we'll see actually the incision is penoscrotal as you can see the incision is penoscrotal 1 cm below the penoscrotal junction this incision makes dilatation easier now we proceed after cutting the skin and subcutaneous tissue we pick up the underlying cremastic fascia and tissue holding with forceps on both sides and we cut with the cautery over an open stilis first dissecting below the superficial layers and gradually progressing to the deeper layers to find the correct plane just above the tunica we simultaneously dissect laterally also in the entire extent of the incision so that both the corpora can be accessed meanwhile while we are dissecting the assistant centers the incision around the urethra by grasping it like that so that the tunica is becomes more prominent and we can go into the right plane as you find the plane we cut over the cautery over an open stilly done correctly this is a very quick and simple way to access the corpora here you are dissecting the deeper tissue and as we see we have almost reached the corpora and just a few flimsy layers are remaining here we are not using the ring retractor if we had one we would be able to retract the skin with it and visualize the corpora but now uh, we go through the incision and capture the penis into our two fingers that is the thumb and the index finger that is the assistant captures the penis and even the surgeon can and to give us control we want to avoid making the incision anteriorly and try and go as posteriorly on the corpora as possible so we try and dissect posteriorly with the finger and then we will insert the retractors so that we can visualize the corpora and the urethra so now we can see we have put in the retractors and we can see the corpora uh, large corpora and the urethra in the center so stays which are taken an opening is made in the left corpus which are described only once later on the right side with lack of time now we proceed to the left corpora dilatation having dilated posteriorly with serial hega dilators we are introducing the nine number hega dilator distally in the longitudinal axis following the index finger avoiding injury to the urethra following the index finger is very critical it makes sure that we are not injuring the urethra as we advance the dilator towards the glands we give counter pressure on the glands if the counter pressure on the glands is in incorrect position then it, we can either dilate to ventrally either either we dilate to dorsally or if it is in the other direction we can dilate to ventrally and if we do that the glands will droop in either direction so we support the glands with the finger on the tip of the glands to ensure that we do not over dilate and this counter pressure and reloading of the dilator is very important into the correct axis to the mid glands if you have dilated correctly the dilator will be at the tip of the corpus and the glands will be stable in the center not dorsal or ventral as you can see we are checking whether the glands is well supported now if we dilate uh, now we'll show in the next step if we dilate a little less as if we withdraw the dilator slightly as we'll see now the glands will be floppy so we have to make sure that when we dilate we dilate all the way up to the uh, mid glands that is the, to the tip of the corpora so that the glands is stable this is very important now we put in the next dilator number 10 and dilate gradually stretching the penis and using the index finger as a guide with the tip of the dilator touching the tip of the finger very important to avoid urethral injury especially for beginners the dilator follows the finger and is dilated slightly dilated slightly laterally catheterization makes this step easier now we push the finger which is placed properly onto the glands of the tip of the dilator rail loading it this way we can achieve controlled dilatation and can't jerk through very important if we over dilate we perforate the distal corpus now we have antibiotic wash which is serves two purposes it reduces the chance of infection second we see the corpus is dilating but there is no fluid coming out from the periurethral region that means there is no urethral injury if you injure the urethra during the dilatation of the first side we abandon the procedure leave the catheter inside and come back after a couple of months the stays which are to be lifted up while dilating or else sometimes by mistake we can dilate into the subcutaneous plane which can lead to a lot of edema later on so this is now the 11 number dilator being introduced again following the same principles of controlled dilatation up to the tip of the corpus using the index finger as a guide now we introduce the 12 number dilator and using similar principles 
to dilate to the glands and confirm that it is, it is going all the way and the glands is stable. So we are gradually dilating. This step is very important. I have kept it slow so that we understand that we have to go good counter pressure and gentle sustained dilatation to reach the mid glands. This comes with experience. Keeping the finger now, we will make a provisional measurement at the mid uh, corporal level. And this came out to be six centimeters. So we are suspicious the incision is a little uh, distal. Antibiotic wash should begin forcefully to detect any urethral injury. Corpus expands, but there is no leakage. Now we move to the opposite side, grasping the penis from within the incision. We have to go deeper down so that we, the cunical opening is adequately posterior. We were slightly on the anterior side opposite. So here we, we actively took down the septum. And as we can see, we have gone more posteriorly to access the corpus. Now we'll take the stage sutures and insert the corpus. So now uh, we can see the urethra in the center and the corpus adjacent. And there is a thin layer of buck's fascia surrounding the urethra and the corpus. One simple downward movement with a mosquito forceps will split the buck's fascia, exposing the white tunica albuginea. Then you take one stage suture one centimeter away from the urethra and further one, another one further one centimeter away. We use black silk on a cutting needle to take the stay sutures. There should not be too much gap between the stay sutures, otherwise the incision will wobble. Now we incise after taking the stay sutures on both sides. We plan to incise the corpora right exactly in between both the stay sutures. We do this as we'll see in the next step using an 11 number blade. We open the copper with an 11 number blade upwards and downwards up to one centimeter. We make sure we do not open it too large in the start initial, initially because we want a dilatation to dilate the entire corpus and not leave the part near the incision undilated. Stay sutures should not be too close to the urethra that, and laterally should be away from the neurovascular bundle. Initially, we, we for the initial subintimal dissection, we use a steely scissor. The steely is inserted with close blades into the subtunical plane, pointing in the vertical and slightly lateral direction. We gradually advance the steely deep, deeper, breaking the fine bands with subtle rocking movements and opening the and closing the blade till we hit the pubic bone. The steely scissors opened with, while we're drawing it out to create a plane. Now, under vision, we insert the steelies into the distal coprotomy ensuring that we do not open the blades too widely. Again, we open the stilies while we're drawing it back. First, we open it, open and close slowly under vision. And as we come back, we open the stilies and withdraw to create a plane. The corporatomy should be away from the urethra, but at the same time, one should be careful not to stray too laterally. Otherwise, we can be very close to the neurovascular bundle, which uh, I will point out now. This is the neurovascular bundle, so we have to stay away from it. Otherwise, we can take it in while closing the coprotomy. Now we proceed for proximal corporal dilatation. The dilators are inserted proximally in a vertical direction with rocking movement, with the final aim being to hit the pubic bone. So now here we see we are hitting the pubic bone after making the rocking movement. So uh, as a beginner, to make sure that there is a dilatation is pro proper, we are going to introduce two dilators. 11 number and 12 number into both the corpora and we see both are going to be both here are parallel and equal in length this is the goal post sign which suggests that we haven't perforated the corpora so after demonstrating this now we will measure the length of the proximal corpora after uh, first we had introduced the 9 in number 10 dilators on the proximal side now after that we are introducing the 11 number and then we will introduce the 12 number dilator generally we have to dilate up to 12 or uh, sometimes uh, if we have a dilator, we can dilate to 13 or 14. We measure the length now by putting in a finger and the length comes up to seven centimeters. This is just a provisional measurement. Distally, we enter the corpus with Hegar's dilators, dilating serially. This time we, we will follow the thumb, which is grasping the catheter. On the right side, the left side, it was the index finger. Near this side, it is the thumb. Control dilatation up to the tip of the corpus is very important. And it is done in this manner by using the thumb as a guide. Gland should be supported by the thumb at the midpoint, very important, like the opposite side, so that the gland is not floppy to ensure the dilatation in correct axis. After we have reached the correct point in the correct axis, up to, up to the mid glands, now we will introduce the next dilator. 
Some corpora stop at the mid glands, while some reach only up to the proximal part of the glands. But on few occasions, the corpus can extend scarily up to two thirds of the glands. So the extent till which one can dilate comes more with the feel and experience. One should try and reach the tip of the glands unless there is fibrosis. In case there is fibrosis, we try and dig our way with the scissors and try to reach the last part of the corpus. Reaching the tip of the corpus with the implant is important for the stability of the glands and is a very important factor for patient satisfaction. At the same time, if you over dilate, it can lead to perforation of the corpus. If we perforate the corpus, we can feel that dilated right at the tip of the glands instead of the mid glands. In that case, we can insert the implant up to the corona and fix it proximally so that it doesn't migrate distally and what, and with some time, the corpus can heal and the implants remain in position. We should avoid over aggressive dilatation, otherwise, it can lead to an injury. Now, we after this long, we are inserting the 12 numbers dilator, dilating until the midlands, again ensuring as the dilator is larger now and it is occupying the entire corpus, we have to be we have to avoid over dilating and being over aggressive. After we have reached our point, midpoint of the glands, we'll measure and the measurement comes 7.5 centimeters. So our provisional measurement is 7.5 plus 7 plus 1 centimeter for incision, which is 16. So now we are going to make three critical measurements. That is the stretch penile length, total corporal length and diameter of each corpus. So for stretch penile length, we stretch the penis and hold the scale on the symphysis. Up and up to the mid lens, we measure the stretch penile length, which is coming up to 9.5 centimeters here. This much portion should be stiff. And then there should be the hinge. So if the penis is long, one needs a longer stiff zone. And if it is short, we need a shorter stiff zone. So that the hinge remains in a constant position, a few centimeters above the pubic symphysis. So the SPL is 9 to 10 centimeters. We use WH9, that is with hinge 9, which is 7 centimeter stiff zone, as I'm showing the finger, 7 centimeter stiff zone. And then the hinge will come. And the hinge is a few centimeters above the pubic symphysis. If the penis was 11 cm, WH11 would have been used, which would have 9 cm stiff zone, measuring, meaning the hinge would remain in the constant position, few cm above the pubic symphysis. And this hinge, which is 5 cm long, uh, the amount of hinge above the pubic symphysis determines the flexibility. And you can see that if the hinge is in the correct position, there will be good flexibility. The SPL is 9, and so we decided to use WH9. Now we measure the corporal diameter by trying to put Next, this is the next measurement by trying to put two dilators in at the same time. We have put the 12 French and 11 French dilator. And we see that the 11 French dilator reaches the tip, uh, the 12 French sh falls short. So corpus is wider in the middle, but the tip is narrower. So here the tip is good for 11 millimeter and the shaft is good for 12 millimeter. And then we will feel for a uh, space between the two dilators. There is little space, but not too much of a space. 11 is reaching up to it there and 12 is reaching up to there, falling short. Now, uh, with uh, this uh, estimation, we are going, going to measure the corporal length, which is in the right side, 7.5 centimeter distally and 7.5 proximally. We are confirming again. We do the same procedure on the opposite side. And following that, that we chart it as follows. Right proximal and distal add up to 15 centimeter plus 1 centimeter incision. So the total corporal length is 16. Similarly, on the left, it is 9 plus 6.5. We were slightly anterior on the that side plus one, which is equal to 16 centimeters. So we have the approximate measurements. Now, before handling the implant, we will change the green sheet and pull the surgical field out to the small hole we make. And all the operating surgeons will change the gloves too. This is done to avoid contamination of implant. Now we peel open the implant pack. This much part is stiff, which gives rigidity. The other is the hinge part, which will give concealment. And the base can be trimmed according to the required length. There are two sleeves. One on the outside, other inside. Removing one will reduce the diameter by two, and removing two will reduce the diameter by four millimeter. There are three relative extenders. One is one centimeter, two centimeter, and three centimeter, which can be attached. And there is an optional cutting tool which is slide and the, into the end and cut. Now we will proceed to extend the copper tomies before uh, putting in the implants because this is important. Initially, this was only one one point five centimeters. Now we'll extend up to three to four centimeters so that we can insert the implant by bending at the hinge. That is the reason we, uh, we increase the coprotomy, we put in the stilies and cut in between the blades, or we can cut on the dilator, which is very safe, so that we do not cut on the posterior wall. Now, next is sizing of the implant. Now, using the scale as we had measured, we cut 16 centimeters in the cutting tool. This has to be precise, and the edges have to be uh, smooth. 
first we insert the insert implant proximally on the left side and after inserting only the proximal part we will uh, stretch the penis and confirm whether the, the length is adequate and the implant reaches the mid lens now we are going to try and put the implant distally with both the sleeves as we have already dilated up to 12 french sega dilator and with the two sleeves is 13 mm and silicon can sometimes behave differently so we push it in dilating the corpus simultaneously initially it reaches till the corona and with further effort and pushing further with supporting the glands it reaches the tip at the mid lens level so after inserting it up to mid lens distally we will proceed to insert the proximal part of the implant we can put either end first that is proximal or distal but the end which we think is going to be more difficult should be ideally put in first on the left side our corpus tongue was slightly distal or more anterior you can say so it is it took more effort but eventually using the figure of four method and by bending the implant at the hinge we were able to succeed as you can see struck little bit of struggle was there but we succeeded we checked that the tip has reached the tip looking for any bulge or any curve with just one implant in there is no bulge or any curve with just one implant in the implant is really solid there is little play between the implant and the gland tip which suggests that there is a good stable glands and at the same time the implant is not pressing so much that it may extrude through so 13 mm implant implant has gone in well now we go on to the other side where again we had measured 16 cm first we put the 12 number dilator again to reassess and we see that the 12 number dilator is falling short and there is no uh, no uh, no gap between the corpora so we may need to remove one sleeve we we'll keep this in mind so there is no gap basically so we may remove one sleeve so now again before introducing we widen the corpora tommy first we go in after widening the corpora tommy when we insert the implant we'll go in with both the sleeves as we had seen on the opposite side after dilating 12 13 implant went but as we see this time as we are introducing it falls short reaching up to the corona and not till the tip of the corpus even persistent efforts it does not reach where we want so now we'll uh, remove the sleeve to reduce the diameter from 13 to 11 mm we pull the outer sleeve back and cut it so that we don't damage the inner sleeve if we cut in the opposite direction there is a risk that will damage the inner sleeve pulling back and cutting this is an inelegant part of the procedure but this is only implant which has two sleeves the versatility helps in keeping the inventory limited otherwise imagine we would need a 9 11 13 mm diameter implant for all the different hinge configurations and we would need to keep 10 to 15 implants ready for each procedure it would be a mess so this is sleeves give it a lot of versatility so now we keep pulling and cutting and yeah eventually with the effort the sleeve comes out and the inner sleeve is not damaged that is very important now we cut at 16 cm after cutting on the we will insert the implant proximally first on the right side and then push it in distally and it goes out goes in easily as this side is the the corpus tongue is well positioned that is it is more posterior so it it goes in comfortably so that's a thing that we should keep the corpus tongue in posterior and now after putting it in we are going to, we are going to assess the adequacy we'll see whether it is reaching our uh, mid lens level at the tip and we see that it is falling short when the penis penis is uh when the penis is stretched completely both are at the same level when it is stretched upwards it is they both are not at the same level and when the skin is stretched downwards both are at the same level suggesting that the right side has not reached its truest potential there is a gap so then we decide to revise the length we again remove the proximal part now we cut by 3 mm and put a 1 cm rate to extend so increasing by 7 mm it is approximate we have to judge according to the case after putting in the rate to extend we insert the implant and this has to be mentioned in the discharge discharge notes for future reference as if revision is required we do not want to leave anything inside so now we insert it approximately after applying the rate to extend and after inserting we are going to again assess whether the adequacy is proper this is very important these small steps are going to give us a very good result now both implants are nearly at the tip with good rigidity and stable glands in this case the concealment will be in the upward direction 
and for sex when we hold it it is really rigid so you conceal in the upward direction and then we assess the rigidity it is super rigid and it is a we will attain a good result now we proceed to the closure of the corpus closure is done with 30 monocle on a cutting needle starting proximally and proceeding distally to achieve tight closure with continuous sutures you have to be careful you don't take very very large bites but it has to be sufficiently uh, closed well and tight so that there is a barrier to any infection and we have to avoid the urethra and urethral bundles by closing another point to note is that if there is urethral injury during dilatation of the second corpus then we leave the implant in the first corpus keep the catheter in situ and return after two months for revision this avoids fibrosis of the corpus as the implant keeps it patent after closing both tunica first we are closing the right tunica continuous clears and then we'll close the opposite tunica after closing that we we will close the cremastic tissue so we, as we see the copper has been closed with continuous sutures and then the opposite side after that we close the cremastic tissue in one or two layers making sure that there is no dead space so that there will be no infection and again that will be done with uh, running monocle sutures here we see the closure of the cremastic tissue to avoid dead space and then the skin will be closed With either ethylon 40 or rapid ethyl 40, and as according to suture we have used, we have to plan for either uh, opening of the dressing or suture removal. So uh, this is a simple case without any comorbidities. So we'll use the first generation cephalosporin and cefotaxime, gentamicin, and repeat the dose at 12 and 24 hours, and discharge an oral augmentin. Operative time is one hour 30 minutes. Blood loss is 100 ml. And uh, some patients implants have severe pain, so IV dynapart thrice a day for 48 hours is used, and the patient is discharged on oral NSAIDs and SOS tramadol. And the catheter removal is done on next day morning. So these are the operative steps. So dressing removal on, should be done post op day seven to ten when the suture removal is with suture removal if non-observable sutures are used, and if rapid cycle is used, dressing removal on post op day four. One should check for sharp pain, edema, scrotal swelling, or hematoma at five, seven, and fourteen days. And one should check for concealment. One should either be able to bend it upward or in a downward direction without pain. Intercourse should be started after six weeks when the glands in the penis is stable. And one can attempt masturbation after four weeks. The post-op course is only one full so that the patient has the correct feel for how to use the implant. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Priyak, for a very comprehensive talk, and that is what we wanted. Where the little pointers that the novice implanter needs to be aware of are highlighted and you did that very well so that was an excellent introduction to anybody who wanted to start penile implants and particularly to someone wanted to do the shy implant so thank you for that now dr chala we have a uh, 20 minutes left either i can do the third talk or we can move to question answers so we'll have your talk and then we'll okay. see about uh, depending okay. on the time we'll go ahead fine so the apart from these three things uh, investigation pd5 um, intracavitelar ejection and implant two topics interest people a lot one is premature ejaculation and the other is peroneal disease so in the time available we are going to take uh, one of the talks and that is peroneal disease still showing my old talk so i may have to take that off the screen and then open a new one okay, now is my slide seen in full screen not yet not yet so okay i'll have to yes okay i think now we are in business so again we're coming to practical management of peronies uh and uh, practical management is very different from the theoretical part so the first and most important message 
and this is based on the referrals that I get because I get many patients come who are referred for cure of Peyronie's disease. The urologist and the patient both come thinking that we will excise the fibrosis, put in a different kind of graft, and the Peyronie's disease will be gone forever. We do not cure Peyronie's disease. We only manage the symptoms to give the patient relief. And this is a very important point to understand because then you will understand how to approach the problem because Peyronie's disease is not one disease. It's a complex of different symptoms and how to manage will depend on which symptoms are present. So Peyronie's could have anxiety about the nodule or pain as a main concern or curvature or instability or ED or shortening. Any or many of these can combine to result in erectile dysfunction and difficulty in, in difficulty in intercourse. So what we do will depend on what the patient presents with. And therefore the first step is to determine from a good history why the patient is seeing us. Because if he has only pain, that management will differ from someone who has pain and curvature, which will be different from someone who has only curvature and no pain, which will be different from somebody who has curvature and ED. And therefore, based on history and physical examination, and very important, assess the erect penis. Patients are encouraged to bring a self photo and the office sildenafil that we spoke about. Very, very useful to assess the patient's erectile capacity and to assess the curvature in three dimensions. Ultrasound, which is widely done, is actually of no use because it underestimates the extent of fibrosis since it picks up only areas that are calcified and in fact, the latest EUA guidelines support this approach. So I almost never do an ultrasound in peronies, but I will almost always do an office sildenafil test, followed by an intrapenile injection if the sildenafil wasn't adequate. And that's all. With that, we initiate management. So many a patient comes who is now in his 60s, not really concerned about sex. He's just worried that is this nodule cancerous? Will it affect my urination? Is it related to prostatic hypertrophy? And once we reassure him that this can remain forever, it doesn't need treatment, though it can be treated, but there's no harm if not treated. And even with the nodule in place, if you're able to, you can continue intercourse. A fair number of patients do not seek any further treatment. All they needed was, was reassurance for this anxiety. Then a large proportion come mainly concerned with pain. Doc, when I get an erection, I have pain. So when they have pain, it means they are in the subacute phase. And the most important method for treating pain is time. Uh, the natural history of Peyronie's is such that pain is self-limiting, taking anywhere from six months to 12 months. Sometimes I've seen up to 18 months for the pain to go away. And while you are buying time, you may use oral medications, most of which are not effective, but some of them, and I'll tell you what I use, may shorten the time taken for the pain to go away. Intralesional injections can also relieve pain. I don't use any of them. Uh, when I speak to other experts, many of them don't use anything, but there are some centers which will routinely use verapamil. Steroids are generally not recommended. There was a question in the chat box, what is the role of Shockwave therapy, uh, low intensity shockwave therapy will help relieve pain. It is of no value in treating curvature or erectile dysfunction. Now of the oral medications, uniform recommendation against vitamin E, Potaba could be used but not easily available in severe GI side effects. Therefore, I don't use it. Tamoxifen, very limited evidence from David Ralph. I've not found it effective, but it will be my Second line therapy, if I'm trying to buy time and other things have not worked. Carnitin, CoQ, again, I've not found effective. What I have found effective, what is the drug that I go to is colchicin. Colchicin acts by altering some of the inflammatory factors associated with peronies. So the dosage I use for colchicin is uh, two, one and a half to two grams a day. So in India, you get a half gram tablet, Gautnil and other brands. So two tablets in the morning, two in the evening, or one in the morning, two in the evening. The main side effect is diarrhea. So I start with one tablet for five days, make it two after five days, then three, and depending on patient tolerance, we'll give three or four.
tablets for three to four months. And I find that almost 70, 80% of the patients will come back saying, doc, my pain is down by 70, 80% on colchicine. Analgesics are used as an on-demand basis. So during the pain phase, we're giving him some oral medication, injection if that's part of your protocol. Most important is we reassure the patient. We tell him that don't worry, in six months your pain will go away. Meanwhile, you can continue intercourse and if pain during eviction is a bother, you can take a painkiller. So we'll give them either diclofenac or tramadol one hour before intercourse and that makes it easier for them to have pain. Sometimes they come complaining of pain and curvature. Now, if there's pain and curvature together, that's a phase where you still cannot opt for surgery because he's in a subacute phase, it hasn't stabilized. So definitive surgical treatment is not possible when pain and curvature are combined. However, this is a phase where the plaque is still not stabilized and therefore, you might be able to reduce the curvature with conservative measures. So one simple measure is manual molding. So we'll give the patient colchicin, also low-dose tadalafil to improve blood flow and tell him that every day you stimulate yourself, get an erection, and then try to stretch the penis against the curvature. So it's like penile physiotherapy, and you might be able to reduce the curvature by 5, 10 degrees, which will make it easier to function. So we can combine it with manual molding or ask them to use a vacuum erection device for 30 minutes, 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the evening. Most patients find the vacuum easy to use and traction difficult to use. One study showed that 90% of men stopped using a traction device within one month because it's quite tedious. New one, Restorex X, recently studied at Mayo Clinic, claims that one hour a day was enough. $500 for the device can be ordered online. I've not had a patient who's used it as yet, though the initial reports and literature seem favorable. In this stage of pain and curvature, that is one phase where intralesional verapamil may be useful. Verapamil is available. I don't use it. Vineet has to so maybe in question answer session, we'll ask him to tell us how he uses it. And here the verapamil could have a dual benefit. It would reduce pain and also reduce curvature to some degree. An alternative is alpha interferon. Mm. Um, if there is curvature alone or instability due to an hourglass deformity, but no pain, these are men who may be candidates for surgery because now they're in a stable phase. Intralesional injection, I would be less inclined to use it now because they're already stable. But if somebody has 45 degree curvature, doesn't want surgery, then maybe you could consider injecting verapamil again. What about collagen? Is everybody asks about it? And I want to tell you that you should not be using it for many reasons. One, not available in India. Two, very, very expensive. The whole course will cost 25,000 US dollars, not rupees, but dollars. And most important, a lot of doctors or patients contact me from where can we get Zyaflex? Because they think that it is a cure for peronies. It is not a cure for peronies. Even at the company website, what they would consider a successful outcome is this, that somebody with 60 degrees now becomes 30 degrees so that sex becomes easy. In other words, about 50% of men injected with collagen is have enough reduction in curvature for them to become sexually more functional. So remember, the Aflex, not a cure, but just an attempt to reduce curvature. And most centers abroad other than the US do not use it because of availability and cost. So having shown it to you, I would say that it's something that you should not bother about. How to correct it surgically, we're going to come to. If there is curvature and ED, then the management changes. So if it's mild ED where taking a sildenafil can give him a good erection, then you could still get away with only corrective surgery to correct the curvature. Now, any process like incision grafting, Excision grafting, of course, will cause ED, but even incision grafting has a likelihood of ED. So if somebody has a very good erection and curvature, incision grafting, good option. But if somebody already has some degree of ED, plication is a better option than incision grafting. If there's curvature with severe ED, 
then you will need a penile implant with additional measures to correct the curvature, which could be modeling or relaxing incisions or relaxing incisions and grafting. And we'll show you pictures of each of this. If there's curvature with ED, with shortening, those are the really severe cases. And those are the ones that would be corrected with an implant, with releasing incisions, with or without a graft. So very briefly now, three types of surgeries we will illustrate. So the surgical options, because you're all surgeons, are plication alone, incision grafting, incision grafting with an implant, implant alone, or implant with molding or releasing incisions. And one of these multiple procedures would be chosen based on, on, based on the presence of severe curvature more than 60 degrees, presence of instability due to hourglass deformity, severe erectile dysfunction that does not respond adequately to oral medication or significant shortening. So here is the first surgical indication, man who's capable of good erections. We did his office sildenafil test, had a very good erection, says doc. At home, I get a similar erection. However, curvature is about 60 degrees and there is pain to the partner and that is why he wants correction. The length is fairly adequate and therefore we would plicate. it. When I plicate it, these men, I tell them that I'm not going to try and make you totally straight. That will cause too much shortening but we are going to reduce you from 60 degrees to 10 degrees or 20 degrees, which will be functionally adequate. So opposite the side of curvature, you take a bite with an Alice forceps to see or predict the outcome of the plication. When you release the Alice, you will see the Alice tooth marks. And between that, you make a vertical incision and close it transversely using an inverted suture of 2O proline where the knot is buried inside and then overlying sutures with 5 ethylon where the knot is not palpable. So this is the result after one suture. You can see that it's not perfectly straight, but there is some degree of shortening, acceptable shortening, acceptable straightening, and we would stop at this point. And this man would be happily functional. The commonest cause of dissatisfaction after peroni surgery is shortening and therefore in Indian patients, I have found that most of them do have short penises to start with and therefore plication is done only in a few patients. Now, this patient has 90 degree curvature, which is too much for plication and there is an hourglass deformity with instability. So he will need incision grafting. So after sliding back the skin, we have an H-shaped incision. The incision is planned at the point of maximum curvature and there are two extensions on either side. When the incision is taken, you wind up with a large rectangular defect. Measure the length and width of the defect. Usually the length will be about, the width across the corpora will be four centimeters and the width across the length will be two and a half to three centimeters. What we use now is bovine pericardium, which is earlier not available, but which is now available from a company in Chennai the cost of the patch is about 24,000 rupees. Very convenient to use, has to be soaked in heparin saline for five minutes. And then you mark out the size of the defect. You can get a four by four patch or a six by six patch. The six by six will give more flexibility in choosing the right side of the patch. And then the patch is sutured in using a continuous suture with 4 ethylon. And the end result you see is already a significantly straightened penis. Maybe you could take one plication stitch on the ventral aspect just proximal to the glands to correct the tilt to the glands and that would result in a very happy patient. Finally, there is a patient with significant shortening. So here you can see the length, nine centimeters only, significant curvature. So in this case, we raise the neurovascular bundle. So technical point, how do you raise the neurovascular bundle? make an incision through the box fascia, just lateral to the urethra on either side, and deepen it till you see the tunica albuginea. Hold the edge of the box fascia, either with Alice's, not Alice's, sorry, with mosquitoes or with your finger that is safer, so that you don't damage the nerves which you can see through the undersurface and the artery. Stick close to the tunica albuginea. So if you make the penis erect, then you can with scissors dissect just off the tunica albuginea, raising the bucks with the neurovascular bundle going all the way to the opposite side. 
And once you've done that, you can then have releasing incisions through the fibrosis. Multiple incisions can be taken. If the width of the defect is less than two centimeters, you can leave it as it is. If it's a very large defect, which sometimes happens in severe curvature, then you may need to put in a patch. So here we've taken a releasing incision and then we dilate the corpora. The incision is dorsal, the dilatation takes place just beneath the tunica ventrally and then we place the implant. And you can see to the left, and I'm showing it with the marker, that the implant is in place, the penis is stretched, but there is cavernosal tissue in, interposed between the implant and the defect. So in this case, we are not going to put a graft. There are other cases where we have sutured a bovine pericardial graft into place. Now instead, we leave the defect and when we pull back the box fascia to cover it, which you can see to the right, the box fascia together with the superficial dartos covers the defect very nicely. And the end result is a beautiful looking penis. The penis which was nine centimeters is now almost 13 centimeters long. It is perfectly straight. The instability is gone. And this would be a very happy patient. So to summarize, key message, you're managing one of five symptoms. You're not curing the disease. The key is really the history and the office sildenafil test. You suture the treatment based, you uh, individualize the treatment based on the size of the penis, the requirement of the patient, the nature of the defect, the presence or absence of erectile dysfunction. Reassurance, very important. Surgery should be done only by a specialist. So with this, we'll now move on to the question answer session. The questions will be read by Dr. Arun Chawla, who will direct it to the panel who is present here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rupin. Now I will go to the chat box and see uh, what questions are there which have not been answered by the panelists. A uh, few questions have already been answered. Um, um, the question on the shock electrotripsy was by Dr. Joseph Philipraj, which you have already answered. Um, I'll go to the... One question I'm seeing while you're reading it is, what antibiotic is used for the wash? Yeah. You could use anything. Antibiotic we wash. tend to use yeah. either saline with chloromycetin or saline with gentamicin. Okay. Uh, there's another question is... Uh, uh, Hager dilator comes in different scales. So what Hager dilator have you used in the demonstration in the, the video which you showed and where is the commonly used dilators? So the Hager we use actually corresponds to diameter. So when we say nine Hager, that would count to, uh, be about 27 French. And we go up to 12, 13, 14 Hager. So it's in millimeters because when we talk of the diameter of the implant, that is in millimeters. So we also talk of the Hega diameter in millimeters. Uh, this question from Dr. Mahesh, well, if there's a youthful in injury, would diversion is safer to reduce inflammation for further implant? Uh, you could divert. I'm a lazy person, so I put in a catheter and we've gotten away with that. But you could also do a suprapubic, especially if you're going to leave an implant in place. Suprapubic diversion for 10 days would be safer. Um, uh, Dr. Lakshan Prabhu has asked any alternatives to bone pericardium, uh, which you mentioned that's very costly and is uh, cost around 25,000 uh, rupees. So with Subness, we've done a series of cases at Muljibai Patil, where we've used the Cephanus vein. Subness uses the ultrasound to isolate, locate the Cephanus vein just below the level of the symphysis, below the level of the pubic tubercle. And through a very small incision, he can harvest a good length. Advantage of Cephanus vein, locally available, very good material. Disadvantage, the width is limited to about one centimeter. So sometimes you have to put in two patches a little distance apart. Other people have used rectus abdominis sheath or even tensor fascia lata with good results. I've not used it. Buccal mucosa, which a lot of urologists are familiar with, is controversial. Some papers have found bad results. Some papers have claimed very good results. Okay, so continuing here only, uh, how would you uh, tailor the graft in relation to the defect? Uh, would you like to oversize it or it will be exactly tailored depending on the difference? Oversize by 20%. Oversize oh, 20%. Uh, 
Uh, the other alternative is dermal graft. If you're using dermal graft, which is cheap and locally available, oversize that by about 35%. Okay. And uh, this uh, final question, which I'm seeing in the chat box, is uh, from Kalyan Ram. Is uh, Evanafil anyway better than Tadalafil or Sidalafil? Practical. We'll ask uh, Raman to answer that. So, sir, actually, I already shown in the table the advantage yep. of Avanafil could be mainly for the side effects. So, uh, what I have also practically seen is the side effects are definitely lower. But at the same time, you know, the efficacy also is, is not up to the mark to probably Sildenafil. Maybe similar to the Dalafil. Uh, Raman, I'll continue the question here to you. Uh, we are seeing very uh, a common practice of recreational use of these uh, PD-5 inhibitors, especially in the younger population. It's available on the counter and people are using it. How do you see this uh, drug when they start uh, using it without any indication and this uh, uh, just for recreational use? Do you find over the time this uh, drugs uh, fail to uh, act or is there resistance to this PD-5 inhibitor in the long term? So I think on this, there uh, all of us will have varied opinions, but of course, we always condemn the use of taking these medicine OTC. One, because the patient is likely to become dependent on them. I have seen many patients who were otherwise having no erectile dysfunction. Just because, you know, they came into the words of their friends or something, they started taking it. And then they became so psychologically dependent on it that they developed a sort of ED. They couldn't perform uh, without them. Or they were all, it was always on the back of their mind that maybe they will not be able to perform as good without it. And that's why they were forced to, you know, continue the use of these medications. So I always, wherever possible, any public forum, uh, any forums, ice cream forum like these, I always would discourage patients to take any OTC uh, hospital asterisk inhibitors. Uh, uh, Raman, a patient, a cardiac patient who is on nitrates, uh, uh, if he has to take PD-5 inhibitor, you have to skip the dose uh, of nitrates on that day or it is timed in a different way? So basically, sir, uh, uh, what we try to do is, of course, we have to skip the nitrates uh, under cardio after cardiology concert. But even after that also, the patient cannot take nitrates for the next 24 to sometimes 48 hours also. So that also has to be emphasized. And he can only choose any short-acting medicines like avanafil or sildenafil. Nothing like tadalafil, which, you know, is going to be in the system for... A about two to three days. Uh, my question to Vineet, we have Caverject. If somebody has to use uh, only intracavernous injection of Caverject, uh, what is the minimum dose they should start? Or you have any particular dose uh, which they should start? So we can usually use a test dose of 7.5 microgram or 15 microgram, depending on, again, the clinical situation. Are you looking at mild disease or moderate to severe disease? But for uh, alprostatil alone, for Caverject alone, you would start at either 7.5 or 15 micrograms of dose. Okay. Uh, is the, this Caverject can also be kept safely at room temperature if it is uh, partially no. used? No, no, it cannot be. It needs to be refrigerated. And that's the basic difference between the use of whether you're making it a trimix combination or whether you're using prostaglandin anywhere, then you need to refrigerate. Uh, I have uh, also found that you can increase the stability of bimix by storing it at a cooler temperature, which means that between the two to eight degrees, if you tend to then uh, use it even for a, or keep it for a longer duration. So some of the patients that come from far distances, I recommend them to use this because they then come in less frequently to take in their uh, re regular next doses. And you can actually increase the stability there also. That is a tricky one because one of the main objections people have to injection is that if you leave it in the fridge, all the family members will also know we have it. So, in fact, therefore, I tell them, don't worry, hide it in your drawer. So, where accessibility is not an issue, in fact, encourage them to keep it discreetly and no need to keep it in the fridge. Because it makes a big difference in their ability to use it, keep it and carry it. Uh, a couple of questions to you, Dr. Rupin. Uh, which technique you described uh, uh, for this uh, uh, peroneal disease plication techniques? Uh, I use the yachia technique, the simple vertical okay. incision and pull it transversely because that requires the least amount of dissection. And okay. if you take multiple small incisions, you can fine tune it very well. 
is this technique associated with minimum loss of uh, penile length or it is the same in all the no. plication techniques the concept of plication is shorten the long side to match the short side however you plike it you are trying to achieve the same thing so plication different methods will produce the same loss of length the differentiating aspect is the risk of um the surgery failing sutures where you are just techniques where you are just taking a stitch through the tunica the suture if it breaks or tears through the tunica the curvature may recur where you actually have a raw surface in the tunica and stitch it together those are more likely to be permanent and not have any recurrence uh another question on incision and grafting techniques uh, do you do circumcision routinely in the patients or uh... no i used to in the beginning but then i had a couple of patients who told me we don't want circumcision and i found that it didn't make a difference we just warned them that they will have prepucial edema for a few days and not to get worried and what is the uh, prospective uh, management of these patient chronic uh, disease whether it is incision grafting or uh, an aspect plication Yeah, so for many experts i know they have no special precaution but something that i do based on my experience is i ask them to wrap an elasto crepe bandage around the penis every night so we don't give any drugs to suppress erection i don't think they help or work but by having an elasto crepe crepe bandage wrapped around the penis we ensure that if he gets a nocturnal erection there is no strain on the suture that we have placed because the penis is being held firm by the elasto crepe that i do for almost 2 to 3 months in the post op period at night yeah that was all uh, thank you very much it was a excellent webinar uh, reen by you a very nice talk and very nice video prank uh, uh, video was excellent i think covering all the the finer points which anybody can encounter Thank All you, the sir. tips and tricks for a successful placement of the shaft prosthesis he has covered. Um, and thanks to you all. I'll just pass on to now uh, mental to Dr. Keshavmurthy for the closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arun. I must thank on behalf of the USI, Dr. Rupin Shah, Dr. Vidhit, Dr. Raman Tanwar, and Priyank Kothari for your time. It was a wonderful session. It was very informative. I think all the delegates who attended have benefited with this. Thank you, Dr. Rupin, and your team for a wonderful Thank webinar. You. Thank you very much for considering sure. andrology. And uh, Thank you, sir. Have a good day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. you all did wonderful, Thank excellent you. lectures. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Glad to be here. Thank you. Bye.